I'm here today with Thomas J. Orr. Thomas is a theologian, philosopher, and scholar of multidisciplinary studies. He's a best-selling and award-winning author, having written or edited more than 25 books. Thomas directs a doctoral program at Northwind Theological Seminary and the Center for Open and Relational Theology. A 12-time faculty award-winning professor, he teaches all around the globe. Thomas is known for his contributions to research on love, open and relational theology, science and religion, and the implications of freedom and relationships for transformation. So Thomas, it's really wonderful to have you here with us today. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Thanks for the invitation, Brian. Well, you know, I'm fascinated by your work. And uh, as we were discussing beforehand, you're a prolific writer. You've really been productive. Yeah, there's something about writing that, uh, you know, I, I think early on in life, I, I was motivated by two things, and they probably still motivate me. <laughs> One of them is, yeah, I think I have an idea that you know, can change the world. And so I want to come in <laughs> or the other one is I see a problem and I think I have a solution or people have been saying X and that's not right. We really need to say Y. So kind of problem solving approaches. That's cool. That's cool. Um, so before we get into your books, though, maybe you could tell people a little bit about your background, the work that you do outside of writing. Sure. I'm a theologian and philosopher, as you mentioned earlier, and uh, I grew up in the church, a little denomination called the Church of the Nazarene, in which I'm still an ordained elder, uh, and uh, faith was a very important part of my life. In fact, uh, early on, I was one of these evangelists. I did a lot of door-to-door -door witnessing. I was a part of Campus Crusade for Christ, uh, um, one of those people who hounded you on airplanes, you know. <laughs> uh, and then my final year of college, I took a course that kind of pulled the rug out of my belief in God. I, I for the first time, read seriously uh, the writings of atheists, agnostics, people from other religious traditions, and realized that the reasons I had for believing there was a God at all weren't very strong. Um, in fact, I remember coming to pick up my fiance, who's now my wife, her getting in the car and saying, I, I can't believe in God anymore. Um, and I was in that state for not a, a long period of time, but I eventually came back to believing that there was a God based primarily on two ideas. Uh, one, I had this deep sense that there ought to be meaning in life, ultimate meaning. And I couldn't make sense of that if there wasn't a source for ultimate meaning we usually call God. And the other one is I, I really thought I ought to be a loving person, that other people ought to be loving. And I couldn't make sense of that intuition if there wasn't something like a source of love, which again, we call God. But um, that then kind of pushed me back into rethinking big questions in life, uh, choosing to live the life as a Christian as best I can, and uh, formulating what that might mean, given challenges in my own mind and challenges I, I encounter in the world. Hmm. So I mentioned that you teach, you know, now at a seminary. Um, yes. What, what other types of teaching jobs have you had before? My first job was teaching philosophy outside of Boston in a little uh, liberal arts institution. And then I got a position teaching theology in Idaho and was there for 15 years until I got kicked out. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, you, you, you're asking that question innocently, but uh, that was actually a big ordeal, national news kind of thing. Hmm. Uh, my uh, president thought I was too controversial and put me through a, a heresy trial. Wow. That, uh, yeah. That I didn't I, realize that. <laughs> yeah, I know you. I know you're asking me that question. Not no, I didn't do that much that. Googling to research you that thoroughly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was kind of a wild, obviously wild, very painful, painful for me, for my family, for my colleagues. Hmm. Um, the president ended up leaving over it because of this and wow. but I didn't get to keep my job. So, um, maybe one way to put it is I've paid some, the price for my beliefs. <laughs> yes. Where did you go after that then? Well, I, uh, 
basically spent about five years trying to make a living as an author, a uh, speaker, and a part-time professor looking for mm. another job mm. until I began uh, to direct this doctoral program at Open and Relational Theology at Northwind Theological Seminary. Mm. So, uh, yeah, I was, yeah, it's a, you know, it's a tough, tough living making money on speaking gigs and, and writing books. Um, and no question. Yeah. I mean, there's very <laughs> few people who do. Yeah. Yeah. So being naive about theology things, can you tell me what open and relational theology means? Sure. The relational simply means that God is in a real relationship with us such that what we do really has an influence on God. Hmm. It's a idea that probably nine out of 10 people who believe in God affirm, but it's not an idea that the major Christian theologians and Muslim theologians, by the way, in history have uh, affirmed hmm. Augustine, Aquinas, Martin Luther, John Calvin. They all thought God was unaffected by anything we do. The openness side of open and relational thought is more controversial. It says that the uh, future is open, not only for us, but also for God, which means that God not only doesn't predestine everything, God doesn't even foreknow with certainty everything that's going to happen. Hmm. So open to relational theologians usually also emphasize creaturely freedom. They usually rethink God's power in ways that are not coercive and do some other things. But those are kind of the big ideas. Interesting. Interesting. Wow. So, you know, 25 books, right? Um, what kind of genre or focus do those span? Yeah, you know, I made a decision early on, and by early, I mean like the mid-90s, that I wanted to try to write books in both, for both the academy and for the, the person on the street, the laity, the, you know, the common person. And, you know, it's hard to have one book appeal to both. So yes. what I would do is I would write a book for the academy and then a book for the church or the mm. person on the street to kind of go back and forth. And I've done that over that time. Um, and not all of those are monographs. At least half of them are edited books. Um, but, yeah, it's been it's been a journey because when you do that, you risk being um you worry about what your colleagues in the academy is are going to think about you writing these easy to understand books you know <laughs> because they're I mean, jealous or because they, it's heresy or what I mean, well they you eventually find out they're jealous <laughs> but at the beginning you you worry about your reputation like you know you want to be known as someone who is a scholar and you you're know, serious yeah. right yeah <laughs> yep but then eventually you find out that almost all of them would love to have, be able to write for, write for the common person. I hear you. But there's another side of that. And that is the common person will sometimes get a hold of the books you write for the academy and read controversial ideas in them and then <laughs> go to their local pastor or bishop or whoever and say, what is that guy saying? So, uh, yeah, there's, there's, uh, there's red flags that can go both ways on that, but I think it's worth it. So, uh, you know, I talk to a lot of different authors and one of the things that I find so fascinating is to ask people how they got their first book published. Mm, yeah. My first book I wrote in seminary, it was going to be a postmodern theology. This would have been in the early nineties. I wrote this book, I sent it out to a whole bunch of publishers and got rejection letter after rejection letter after rejection letter. I look back on it now and I'm so glad they rejected me because uh, uh. It, was, it was not a very well written book. <laughs> but I eventually thought to myself, well, maybe what I can do is instead of me being the only author, since you know I'm a nobody, um, I could combine this with some other people who were generation Xers. And so that's what I did. I pitched the uh, an edited book of 10 essays on Generation X. And then I knew that my particular small denomination might be interested in this book. So the book was called Generation Xers Talk About the Church of the Nazarene or something like that. Oh, wow. Um, that was my first book. And um, I'm, how should I say this? Um, 
I think most people are proudest of their monographs, but I'm very proud also of my edited books hmm. in part because wow. over the years, I have made it possible for lots of people to publish their first mm. essay in a book. Mm. And some of the books have been huge, like 80 to 120 essays. Um, so I feel like my editing these books has been a way for other people to kind of share their voice, get their ideas out. And I feel good about that. I think that's excellent. I mean, I think it's very valuable for authors to share their platforms. Yeah. But a lot of publishers are not interested in those kinds of books. Exactly right. And that's why I started my own press about a decade ago. <laughs> 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 I wanted to do a book, uh, a controversial book on evolution in the Church of the Nazarene. Uh, for those of you who don't know the Church of the Nazarene, it's a pretty conservative denomination in the Wesleyan holiness tradition. Um, and a book on evolution wasn't going to be published by the, the denominational press. So I said, well, maybe it's time for me to start my own press. And so that's what I did. Well, that, let's talk about that whole area for a moment, too, because the whole, you know, um, idea of self-publishing or independent publishing um, has just blossomed, right? I mean, yeah. it didn't hardly really exist, you know, several years ago. And now with the advent of print on demand and easy online portals, you know, to be able to get your book off for sale. It's just changed tremendously. Um, yes. How, how have you found that to work? How, how well and what, what aspects of it do you like and dislike? Yeah, early on, it was a little more of a struggle in part because uh, independent publishing didn't still had a really bad rap. I mean, it still does in some circles, but a decade ago, even worse, it was really looked on as in suspicion. Um, but over time, not only has it changed and the perception changed, but there are so many advantages to self-publishing or I, again, I prefer to call it independent publishing. Um, one of them is you have control over what the book is going to be, which you don't always have with other publishers. You get to decide what the cover is going to be, which again, I published with, I think I've published with 11 presses in my life. Uh, and many of those books came out with covers I didn't particularly like, but I didn't have a choice on that. Um, most of the royalties I got from those books were somewhere between seven and 10 cents, which means that I was getting less than a buck a book. Whereas wow. with independent publishers, you know, I'm getting six, seven bucks a book. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's much more profitable. And so many publishers today, the vast majority of publishers today rely upon the author herself or himself to do the promotion of the book. Absolutely. They're relying on the platform of the author. Yep. And so I said, well, heck, if they're going to want me to promote it, <laughs> maybe I ought to get paid for that. <laughs> it really begs the question, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, why do I need a publisher? <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. So, no, I mean, having said that, I mean, they do, you know, pro some of them, right. Provide sure. really excellent editorial services. And, um, you know, publicity and distribution. So it's, it's, you know. Yeah, I think there is this, some tricks you have to learn to overcome some of those things like, you know, editorial issues. I pay people to edit my books. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a expense out of my pocket, but I can do it more cheaply, I think, than I would have to in terms of overall pay. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, there's, there's pros and cons. I publish both independently and with established presses, but generally in the last five years, I've done more independent uh, than the established presses. Hmm. And what have you found to be most successful when it comes to marketing your books? Um, I use a lot of strategies. Uh, ones that some people know about, like you know, pub, uh, marketing through Amazon or Facebook. But I think the most effective is probably good old sending an email to someone you know and saying, my book just came out. Would you consider it? Hmm. Um, I think that's the most effective. Last night, I sent about 40 uh, private Facebook messages to people on my list saying that I have a book came out 
lately and asking what they were up to, just starting a conversation. Um, that I'm doing that in part because I want them to know about my book, but also because I want them to know I care about what they're up to. So that kind of relationship stuff, I think, is really helpful. It's nothing like um, building, maintaining relationships. Uh, right. No, no doubt about that. Yep. So let's talk about some of the specific books. You know, which one would you like to tell the folks about? Hmm. <laughs> Well, um, how about if we start with the book that's probably one of the more controversial ones called God Can't. Okay. <laughs> I wrote a book in 2015 published by InterVarsity Academic called The Uncontrolling Love of God. And it makes the provocative claim that God simply can't control others. So the suffering and pain that we endure is not because God either caused it or allowed it but God simply couldn't stop it single-handedly. And I'm happy to say that book won some awards. It made, has made an influence. But many people came to me and said, you know, I'd like to give a book to my mother <laughs> <laughs> that she can understand. <laughs> so why don't you write a book that's written for the common person, which, mm -hmm. again, I've been doing kind of that for a long time. And so the book God Can't is really written at the you know, lay level. Um, and it offers a five-fold solution to the questions of suffering, saying God simply can't stop it, but God suffers with us. God works to heal, but can't do it single-handedly. God tries to squeeze good out of evil, and also that God calls upon us to overcome evil with good. So that book's sold more than probably any of my other books uh, and has made a bigger impact probably overall. Hmm. What year did that come out? That came out in 2019. Okay. 29, yeah, January of 2019. Cool. And was that self-published or was that? Uh... Yes, that was my own press. Yeah, okay. Sacker Sage Press. Yep. Okay. And then, like, what's your most recent book? Well, I had two come out this summer, one that I co-edited and another that was a monograph. The monograph is called Open and Relational Theology, an Introduction to Life-Changing Ideas. It's also written for the kind of the average person, and it presents this way of thinking um, so that people can kind of get past the academic ease and, and understand what the issues are. The other book is a book called Partnering with God. And uh, I joined with three other editors. It uh, offers very short essays. I think there's, mm, I've forgotten the exact number, but about 80. Mm, wow. Um, and there are people writing on the theme. What, is, why, what does it mean to partner with God? And mm. that's, that book is interesting in that it's got a number of very established and well-known theologians, people like John Cobb. And a number of people for whom this is the very first essay they've ever had published in a book. Cool. Yeah. That's, that's fun. It, I mean, you know, like we were talking about before, collaboration is just such a valuable and fun thing to do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, you mind if I say something quick about that particular book? Sure, of course. Um, one of my co editors sent me an email near the end of October of last year and said, I've got an idea for a book. What if we did this collection of essays? And I said, sounds fantastic. Let's get a couple other co-editors and let's divvy up responsibilities. We sent the call out, I think in November, might've been even early December. And that book went to press or was published, was made available in August. That gives you an idea of what book publishing can look like when you're using an independent press from October to August is what it took for 80 some essays. Wow. So you got an administrative nightmare, right? <laughs> but no, I mean, I, I can <laughs> so relate to that because I did a yeah. kind of thing with how to heal our divides. Oh, yeah. I remember you talking about that. At, I, uh, didn't, at I didn't News. start yeah. talking to anyone about it until November of last yeah. year. Yeah. The book came out in May. Yeah. Now we only had 33 <laughs> contributors, not 80. Yeah. So I only had to herd that number of cats. Instead yeah. Of, you know, a larger number of cats like you did. But still, I mean, that's just part of the power of independent yeah. publishing. It's a exactly. you know, get motivated people. And, you know, 
the stars align, you can really um, get things done quickly. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And, and I don't know what all of your motives were in that particular book, but some of my motives for the kind of edited books I have are oftentimes to give a group of people a sense of identity hmm. and momentum, that they're a part of something bigger than themselves, a, a kind of common cause. And I find that, uh, man, that reaps lots of benefits for them individually and for as the group as, as a whole. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can totally see that. Um, my motivation primarily was to build awareness of these organizations and people that were actually nice. doing something, you know, to heal divides. And, and when I say doing something, I mean like training, and, you know, other kinds of things, not just talking about it. Yep. Right. So my number one priority was to just raise awareness of all those organizations. But there's definitely this kind of um, bigger than yourself aspect of it, too. That, yes. You know, these organizations liked being associated with other organizations, not necessarily big, but, you know, other organizations that were, you know, kind of equally passionate and effective, you know what I mean? It yeah. Really yeah. Position, so. yeah. That's, That's great. Phenomenon. So um, what else are you working on? <laughs> Obviously you're not done, right? Uh, <laughs> you do so much of this, uh, but I mean, without, you know, divulging anything that you don't want to talk about publicly, what, anything you can talk about? Well, this morning I was writing a book that I'm thinking about calling Full Orbed Love, in which I'm, uh, it's more an academic book. It's looking at major theolo theologians and theological perspectives and criticizing them, <laughs> hmm. criticizing them for not taking love seriously as the central concern for theology, God's wow. love and our love. Wow. And so that means like making some technical moves and you know, making provocative claims like, uh, you know, things like God doesn't control because love doesn't control and things like that. So my current book that I'm working on, and I hope to have it done by the end of this year, will be a more academic book uh, aimed uh, at theologians. Hmm. Very cool. Very cool. Well, so where's the best places for people to go to find out about all of this? Well, uh, you can contact me through various social media platforms, but uh, I have a personal website, which is my full name, Thomas J J A Y Ord O O R D dot com. Um, I all, you can also find great resources if you're interested in open and relational theology at the Center for Open and Relational Theology. Probably easiest <clears throat> just to Google that one. Um, those are the kinds of places probably I I should send people. Hmm. Well, Tom, it was really great to, you know, learn about your work and uh, get to know you more. And uh, congratulations on all you've accomplished and uh, look forward to um, collaborating further. Excellent. Thanks, Brian. I've enjoyed the conversation.